Welcome back to the Life Wide Open podcast. We got Keaton Hoskins sitting over here. You guys might know him as The Muscle. You recognize him from Instagram or his uh, TV show, The Diesel Brothers. You're a motivational speaker, an author, just an all-around cool guy, so we're stoked to have you on the podcast. Thanks, man. I'm excited to be here. We were pretty concerned after yesterday. We didn't know if you and Ryan maybe had some beef. You guys were kind of in the back of the race, uh, button up against each other. Dude, I was out there. You were in front of me, and I was like, I could accidentally spin him out right now. <laughs> and I was like, but we got business later. We got the podcast coming. I can't risk that. Also, yeah. I didn't want to get the shit kicked out of me. So You know what, dude? I would have been <laughs> fine with it. I was waiting. I had, I think I had two really close calls where somebody bumped me. I don't know if it was mm-hmm. you or somebody else. And they spun me pretty bad, but I recovered both times. Mm-hmm. I thought for sure I was going into the helicopter. Yeah, that's what I was worried about, too. It they was parked, a risky spot. Yeah, they right. parked the helicopter in the middle of the field like there wasn't a race going on around the thing. Yeah, for sure, dude. Being that there was a helicopter on the line, I, like that was like a huge you know, prize for like everyone else in there. But you already have a helicopter, so was that... Was that even, no. obviously, it'd be sick to win it. But. Yeah, I. so Cletus and I actually talked before the race, uh, and I was like, bro, what's the cash buyout here? Because I not that I don't want the helicopter, but I don't, I'm too big for it. Oh, that too. So it would, t- it would lift me up, because I think the lift power is like 500 pounds, right? And I'm not 500, but there's also what's called a center of gravity in helicopters, which most people don't know, so you can't have a certain weight on side to side so like on smaller helicopters there's a weight limit on a seat per side yeah per side and the weight limit on that is 230 pounds how much are you weigh i'm like 280 how tall are you six three god you're a big Jeez. dude yeah. I get, so Beast. so uh the muscle where'd that name come from I'm so glad you asked because hopefully your listeners aren't like, who's this douchebag that named himself the muscle? (laughs) So we started our TV show forever and ever and ever ago. But before we had our TV show, we were just doing social media, like trying to make social media go big. We were really one of the first ones that went big on Facebook. We, We started a truck page called Diesel Trucks for Sell. It's actually still up. And it connected everybody in the United States that wanted to buy and sell trucks. You and Heavy D. Heavy D, Diesel Dave, and then Redbeard. Yep. We started making content that went viral. That's actually how we got our TV show. Well, on one of the very first videos, I had built a truck that we had cut in half and made six doors. And it was a monster. It was like 900 horsepower on 40s. And we were doing donuts in a circle around Diesel Dave. And I ha- I didn't have a nickname, right? So Diesel Dave was like, I'm here with Heavy D and... The muscle that he's the (laughs) one that named, yeah, he named me. And then we put it out and it went really, really viral. So Dave's like, hey, bro, that's your your name now. (laughs) Yeah. So Uh, that's where it came from. Dude, we we were just on a podcast with Grindhard Plum and Co., the YouTube channel. And uh, one of the guys, Ethan, had a show. He didn't even say what network it was on. It was on Discovery. Okay. uh, So he had a Discovery TV show before the YouTube channel too. but. You know how it is with the producers, how they like come in there and they like try and make something that's not how it yes, is. And they make always. a character out of out of something that always. is not their real personality. And uh, so we had the same thing where we filmed like a pilot episode and they tried giving me the name Doogie. <laughs> he <laughs> so could have been Doogie so for the I rest of his life. Doogie. I'm calling you Doogie. Dude, the, sure. the muscle's a sick name. Yeah. Like, you can't complain here's about the that. Thing. And it's Here, fitting. I, here's the thing, though. When you go anywhere and that's what... Because people think you named yourself, right? Like Heavy D named himself. So that's kind of... Oh, deep, really? Right? Oh, he told but me you didn't. But like, dude, the <laughs> thing is, is like the muscle really does sound douchey. Like it's like this douchebag called himself the muscle. But that's not why. It wasn't because I was big. It was because when shit needed to get done they would call me in to muscle through and get it done. Okay. It. That's why. Because, like, even now, people are like, oh, you're this this big fat guy. You're not even, you call yourself the muscle. I'm like, dude, that's not even why they fucking call me. Can I swear yeah. on your yeah. podcast? Yeah, yeah of course. That's not even why they fucking call me the muscle. They call me the muscle because when shit needs to get done, I have to fucking come in and muscle it and get it done. Like shake some guys up or what? Well, I mean, anything. Like, you know, like if there was a around. real if there was a real negotiation that needed to happen, right, I'm the one that came in. If there was somebody that's who it. owed us money, it's like, dude, you owe us money. You need to get us paid, whatever. If there was a deal that needed to get pushed through, if there was employees that weren't doing what they were supposed to do and they didn't listen to anybody. Them. Yeah. It's like, dude, this guy's going to come through and muscle it and get it done. Makes sense. That's a, like that's a good I would name. shit my pants if you came up and started yeah. shaking me down. <laughs> so that's where it came from. But dude, 
it is always a battle for me because I think it's douchey. Like, dude, if somebody was like, that's the muscle, I'd be like, fuck. <laughs> like, that's so stupid. So I now tell people, like, I know where I'm at when I hear, hey, what's up, Keaton? I know it's somebody who knows me. Or if it's like, hey, it's the muscle, I'm like, that's oh, a it's, fan, yeah. you yeah. know? Well, Which sorry to mind. introduce you like that. No, you're good. <laughs> you're good because everybody introduced me. I mean, that's what my brand is, and yeah. I get it, and I love it. I love my brand. I just, I always like to tell people like, hey, man, before we even start a podcast, because the first thing they're going to hear, who's this muscle guy? Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm like, listen, I already know it's douchey, but that's my brand, so Fair that's it what it if, is. If it means anything yeah, I think it's a great name. Thank yeah. you, man. And I appreciate I mean, it. Our name's pretty... Uh, you can make fun of it pretty easily. Yeah. And we we didn't pick our name either. I mean, granted, put that as a YouTube channel. Yeah. And then it, it actually became... What does became, it stand for? So the town we're from is Cormorant, and we were just... And that all, starts with a C? C. Yeah, it starts oh, with a C. I would have I guessed Q. You no, know, oh. Cormorant, yeah. Okay. And uh, we were just always hanging out, and, like, neighboring town kids would come, and they just grouped us as one, like the Sea oh. boys Oh, I'm going to hang out with the Sea boys today. We're going dirt bike, and we're doing whatever. Yeah. And then... Made the channel just C Boys TV. It was going to be a TV show on just us sure. oh, hanging out. And now we're, and, I, and people think we were just like, we're the C Boys. No and one else can join. This is our crew. You know, this yeah. is our gang, which yeah. is not really. It does. It kind of feels douchey, right? It people does. Like, like it's, oh, it's the, easy to yeah. make fun of. Yeah. So, so well, yeah, we, we feel you on the that. The one we but. get now is when everyone goes, well, what happens when you guys grow up? Are you going to be the C men? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many people. Yeah. And every time somebody says it, they think they're the first person to come up with that. And it's like, well, the it thing, would be pretty good funny. Guys. Like the thing at is, age 40. Yeah, I was going to say, when it, you guys are like semen. 50 and they're like, the C boys are like, wait, what? They're all 50, dude. The what do you mean now? The C yeah, boys. maybe we actually C will have It'd to be kind of funny. <laughs> like, it, would have to be, it would have to be, yeah, it would have to be C Seamen, yeah, yeah, the we, C -men. yeah. That's it's the only, the only way to go. That's the only way. We make yeah. like a pact with our followers that at this date, when we're all this age, the YouTube channel name is getting changed to Seamen. <laughs> Has to, dude. The retention, like they've been staying <laughs> like fifteen years. Like I'm yeah. ready for this. You know, how many is there of you guys in your group? So there's like five original C boys, I guess you could say, and then Evan, who yeah. was deathly afraid of the helicopter, who you got on. He just knocked on the door, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, they okay, just yep, came back yep, from yep. whatever they were doing. Uh, he was kind of like the sixth addition to it, and then we've got kind of a, just a team now got it, yeah. of a bunch of other people yeah. um, that help make the videos. But it's it's tough because, like, you know, there is a lot of us, you know, yeah. and, like the yeah. Diesel brothers, but you guys all kind of have your own brands and, yeah. and personalities now but did you kind of run into that like at the time when you guys were like rolling around it's like a pack? yeah in fact dude i'll tell you guys this and take this to your graves you will always be better in groups than you will individually you always see take bands for example right like bands get together they create this great shit music content whatever and then there's usually a fight and they split up and they always try to do their own thing and it's just it's never the same thing and for us, because Diesel Dave and Heavy D and myself, like we're best friends. We hang out all the time. It wasn't ever an issue. There was one time where we had an issue and, and you know, it was like, maybe we are going to go our own separate ways. But even with Heavy D doing his YouTube channel, which I don't want to really be a part of, we're still very, very tight knit. Like when people call in, hey, the Diesel Brothers, like that's that's who we are and that's what we do, even though we all have a little bit separate stuff. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you guys, the best advice I'll give you, always stay together, smash the bullshit because there will be bullshit, especially as you guys get older. Your power will be in your group. It will not be individually. Even if one rises to more fame, it will it will still burn out in a way that it wouldn't have if you guys stay together because there's so many individuals here that each person has a demographic that follows everybody yeah right like i have a huge demographic that follows me and now they follow dave and they wouldn't otherwise and dave has a huge demographic of people that follow him that wouldn't follow me otherwise and if we split we start to lose that type of a demographic right no, that that's some awesome advice, and and we do realize that actually, and we're going on eight years of doing this, and uh, we've we've seen that with other groups, yeah. and I, I think that's been you know a major part as to our success is we all respect each and every one of us, and we all know that someone brings something different to yeah. the table, and and it's the dynamic that really creates you guys the are circle. Really you smart. Know? One of uh, one of the guys that I watch do it, the opposite of what I'm talking about is Richard Rollins. 
Mm -hmm. You know, him and Aaron, when they started Gas Monkey Garage, it was him and he sucked. And then he brought in Aaron and him and Aaron were great together. And then they split and Aaron, because of fighting, Aaron tried to do his own thing, fell off. Richard has fallen off. I mean, I know he's still oh, like semi something, but dude, they would have been so much more powerful together than if they wouldn't have split. Hundred percent. Yeah, you see that all the time. Yep. And it's just tough though with when you get you know people's lives continue to get a little bit more tricky with families, and yep. then you got egos, and then people yep. people that, in their ear. That's what yep. I think is ear. one of the biggest well, things. And the, the other wrong guy in your ear. The other thing is money. The other thing is money. Like you have to understand what everybody in the group's value is and everybody's value is different. You know, like I, I'm the first to admit heavy D's value when it came to TV was greater than mine. And I was okay with getting paid less because he was greater in his value as for what he brought. And that that's a hard thing for some people, you know, like you see the, uh, the TV show friends, all of them make a ton of money, but they definitely make they different, different amounts of money. But when they negotiated in their contracts, they negotiated to be very, very similar. And they made a pact. They were like, hey, we're never going to leave this. And it's one of the reasons why that's one of the biggest sitcoms in the world. And still to this day is watched because of that, that whole idea. And if you get every individual on the team and every individual understands what they bring. And then and this is one of the most th- this is one of the things I teach people a lot. The universal law is that everybody wants one thing. Everybody. Every single person wants to feel important. Like every person you'll ever meet in your life. And the truth is, if you understand that principle, you'll be successful as shit. But if you get into a place where people are paid separately and there's this issue and that issue, as long as you continue as a group to make every individual feel important, you will continue to grow and grow and grow. And you guys will be huge. Like I'm telling you, the next five years for you guys is going to be insane. As long as you stick to that, you stick together, you make sure each one of you feel important from each other, mm-hmm. right? And I'm telling you, dude, you, you'll you exponentially grow. Do you also think that when there's different like pace structures like that too, there becomes like less resent because it's like you also kind of know, you know, if everyone's doing or getting paid the exact same, but the workload is not the same, mm-hmm. then that will kind of tear people apart yeah, too. Absolutely. Even well, more than we'll do the hard would. thing is, and it goes back to that universal principle, everybody thinks they're important and everybody thinks that they're the the driver. Like no matter who it is, right? If you watched our TV show, you know that Heavy D is the guy, right? And then you know that Diesel Dave is the next guy. And then you know that the muscle is the next guy. Well, dude, if if I went in there and I was like, dude, I'm just as important as you. I should be being paid what you're getting paid. Well, that causes riff. Mm -hmm. It just does. And then I go, fuck you. I'm out of here. And then all of a sudden it's just you two. And it doesn't work as well. It just doesn't. I mean, dude, Dave and I, Heavy D and I literally just had this conversation. We were at the UFC fights with Dana White and Donald Trump. And we were backstage and literally both of us were at the same time. We were like, dude, we're so much more powerful together than when we are separate because there's so many things that we can bring to the table that Dave may make $3 million by himself and I may make $3 million by myself, but together we can make $10 million. So there's, that's what you have to understand. And the more you understand that, especially as a a unit like you guys have, and you have a lot, a lot of personalities make it really, really hard. But if you do this principle, you have the opportunity to go one way or the other. You're going to get the shit kicked out of you. You're going to stick together and you're going to rise or you're going to get the shit kicked out of you. You're going to split and then everybody's going to do way less than what was possible. I agree completely. I do do too. And we always try and remember that. And Mm -hmm. well, we do remember that. And that's, you know, what's kind of just made our group group successful and, and stay together. But when you speak, you have so much like, wisdom behind what you're saying like have you always been that way like how how did you get to this point no so um most of your listeners probably don't know all the things that i do um i've been an entrepreneur for a really long time i've built a ton of businesses it's actually funny a lot of people always are like well you're you only made it because you were on a tv show i'm like i was a millionaire before we got to a tv show i had built nine companies before the tv show had ever started within the last five years i've honed in on personal development which is the number one key to success period across the board. And in doing that, I have learned really, really important principles. Like one of the most important principles you guys can learn 
there was a kid, uh, he was interviewing Warren Buffett, which I'm not a huge fan of Warren Buffett. I think he's a slave to money, even though he has a ton of money. But he was interviewing him. He said, hey, what would be your number one advice to young people wanting to make it? And Warren Buffett said, you need to focus on personal development. And in personal development, you need to focus on your ability to communicate. Like communication is everything. The way you portray a message is everything. If I have a vision and I can't communicate, I'm never going to get it done. If I'm a dipshit and I can communicate, I can still make a ton of money and a ton of success. So about five years ago, I, uh, I decided, you know what, dude, I'm kind of a dipshit. Like I'm just not that great. You know, I was like, I'm going to go very, very hard in investing in my personal growth. And so I did that and I hired a mentor and I did as much as I could. And over the last five years, I have by 10 X my ability to do anything across the board. And one of those is communicate, you know, my, my ability to speak is because I've worked so hard and invested so much into being able to sit down with any person at any time and communicate very adequately. My message, one of the best things I could tell any young person who wants to be successful outside of communication, and it still falls in the line of communication is you should learn how to master a stranger. Most people are like, I don't know what that means, master a stranger. Your ability to walk up to somebody at any point and master a stranger is your ability to network, make money, be successful, create a vision, get them to do what it, whatever it is that your interaction is supposed to do. And so again, like those kinds of things, I was like, dude, I want to be good at that. Dude, one of the reasons that Dave Heavy D brings me around so much is because he's horrible at that. He's horrible at mastering a stranger. He's actually horrible at, at interacting. You guys probably have seen that. Like he really struggles unless it's like a one-on-one. -on -one. He's really great one-on-one, -on -one, but he struggles in like crowds. He has a lot of social anxiety. And so he, he's always like, hey, man, can, can you come to this event? Can you, I, I want everybody to feel welcome. I want everybody to f be happy, have a really good time. And he knows like my ability to step in a room with a hundred strangers and make them all feel the way that they want to feel. I'm really good at. So he's always like, hey, dude, I need you to come out. You need to come do whatever. When you say master a stranger, so you haven't met Ken over here. Like what, what would be like an opening, I guess, conversation? You go up to him and you say, hey, man, like what's going on with your shirt? Life wide open. Yeah. Like, like how, what's your so, foot in the door? Really, really easy. And, and this is actually just a playbook that you can use for everything. If I, get, if I just start it, you guys won't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I'll give you a quick playbook and it's really simple. So everybody, and this goes back again, I'll probably talk about this a few times, but the universal law of everybody wants to feel important. Like everybody in your life wants to feel important. It's why they have the job they have, the car they have. Think about it. The people you know who have the, the Camaro, right? Their, their name is Camaro Tim. Yeah. Or the guy who drives the GTR. He's at car meets. He's like, check out my car. Yeah. Why? It's, usually a it's not bag. because, yeah, I mean, he's usually a yeah. It's not because <laughs> his on, car's guys. fucking cool. Yeah. It's because that's what makes him feel important. So that's what he clings to. Yeah. So you understand the law, right? So I, I meet, what'd you say your name is? Ken. So I meet him and instead of immediately doing with et, what every person does, which is tell you how important I am. Now think about yesterday, right? We met all kinds of cool influencers and celebrities. Everybody there wanted to tell you how cool they were. How important. I got a YouTube channel. I got this. I got this. I got this. They want to tell you how important they are. Well, if you walk into the room and you meet a stranger and the first thing you do is introduce yourself and you go, I'm just going to listen to you. Mm -hmm. Let me listen. Mm -hmm. And then when you listen, they're going to tell you what makes them feel important. And then when they tell you, fucking lean into that. Ken tells me he has this freaking sick motorcycle, right? And that's what makes him feel important. Well, then that's where my conversation is headed. You know what's so cool about you, Ken, is that that motorcycle is this year. And what's so cool is it's rare that you have it and, and you're a good driver. Then you start talking about what makes him feel important and all of a sudden, boom, you've mastered that interaction and it's a stranger who you don't know. And the thing is, is this principle applies to the relationships you have, not just strangers. It just helps you when you're talking to strangers. Yeah. So I sit down with him and we talk for two minutes and it's majority of him talking. I'm mm -hmm. fucking listening. I was going to say that people like to be listened to. Yes. If you came in and you talked to him the whole two minutes, they'd be like, well, that was cool, but I, we don't have any connection. But Absolutely. if someone, if you speak to someone, the person who's speaking feels like they have the connection, which 100%, is hundred cool. percent, dude. And the thing is, is like the, a lot of people always like want to bring value, right? 
If you don't have any money, everything's hard to bring value. It's not hard to bring value. Find out what's rare. What's rare is fucking listening. Go into a room and listen to somebody. For the first time in their life, they meet somebody who's listening to them, right? Why do people pay for therapists? Because therapists just listen to them. Like, I'm paying you so you can hear me. Mm. Therapists don't, they're all over the place. But they sit there and they take notes and they listen to you. Why do you pay 250 bucks an hour? Because he's fucking listening to me. Right, you almost like work it out in your own head. Just like telling somebody. Exactly, exactly. And so... For me, that's what I tell people. Like, if you want to be rare, you want to make an impression on somebody, you want to master a stranger, just walk up to somebody in confidence and listen to what they have to say. And then find the points, right? And it would take me five minutes to talk to him to find out what makes him feel important, what he likes, what he's interested in. Without me talk, I don't need to say anything. And then once I find it, I go, oh, let me lean into that because it makes him feel important. And then he leaves there and he goes, fuck, that dude was cool. Yep. That dude was cool as shit. Mm-hmm. And it was simple, it was simple. So that's the recipe. Yep. Were you pretty good at like talking to girls too? I know you're I married now. Yeah, I was. I, imagine I was that. really, really good with that. That was what kind of set me into that, that, that path. I got, uh, I got divorced when I was 27, 28 and, and it was like at a hype of our famous. It was, I was making money. I was Instagram famous, TV famous. So it was really easy to like get a date. Well, I dated a ton, and I, I never, ever wanted to have an awkward moment. So I got really good at talking with girls, mm-hmm. you know, interactions with them and getting them to do whatever I wanted, right? Like, hey, man, this is what I want. This is what we're going to do. But that uh, eventually that sent me down the path of like, dude, I should be able to do that with anybody, not just a girl that I want to date. I yeah. should be able to do that with every single person I have an interaction with. There is something to be said about being able to like, kind of get past the small talk side of things yeah. with, with, with people, you know, cause then that's just like base level. Yeah. And then you get into like the nitty gritty of and like, it's the an, worst, an dude. I've been saying that for a long it's time. The worst. Something that I've wanted to be better at is cutting out the, Hey man, how are you? Good. How yeah. are you? Sweet man. What's you, what you've been doing? Like it just never goes anywhere. So that's something I've been trying to learn. Lately. Dude, a good example. I knew a lot of the guys there yesterday, but I didn't know everybody. Um, and that was my first time having a conversation with Travis Pastrana. Mm-hmm. I did this exact same thing with Travis yesterday. I was like, dude, so awesome that you're here. Like, what uh, what do you do to prepare for a race, right? And I'm asking him all kinds of things. What makes Travis feel important? Well, dude, he's a racer. He's a freaking stunt guy. He's crazy. So I'm sitting there listening, listening, listening to him. I was like, dude, it's such an honor that I even get to come out here and race with you today. Like, he and he was blown away, right? Mm-hmm. Same thing with Tanner. I'm just like, I, I sat with Tanner for 20 minutes, and I was like, so, dude, what do I need to know about racing? Like, this is my first real race. I, I'm a driver and I ride everything, but like, what's, you know, and I just sat there and listened Yeah, and created a great relationship. Yeah. So you said uh, that you'd started like nine businesses. What were some of those businesses? So I've built, started, um, launched, whatever you want to call it, over 30 companies. When, when I was did you start when you were young? Yeah, yeah. So when I was 21, so I was a missionary. I was a, a, a Mormon missionary. I came back from my mission at 21, and my father passed away about three months later. My dad was like the whole 9 to 5, 401k, retire at 65, that whole mentality. Go to school, get a degree. And he was like, that's the safe route. That's how he taught me the whole way up, right? And when he got sick the last few years, he was the CEO of a big company, actually, they just threw him to the wind. They're really? just like, you're, you're sick. We don't want you anymore. And, and all of a sudden, I think he realized like, oh, shit, what I've been preaching isn't real. And I saw that. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know what, man? I'm not going to do that route. I'm going to do whatever I want. I can't really work for anybody. I just can't do that, you know? So I began to start businesses. One of my first businesses uh, was, uh, it was called MoFit. It stood for Mobile Fitness. I started personal training. Today's podcast is sponsored by One Skin. One Skin is here to target the root cause of aging and not just make your skin look younger, but to go deeper and focus on the cellular aspects of aging. The secret is One Skin's proprietary OS01 peptide, and it's the first ingredient proven to switch off the aging cells that cause lines, wrinkles, and thinning skin. And they've got several studies to back it up. Skincare isn't one of those things that I spend a lot of time doing, but once I started using one skin on my face, I really do love it. It's quick and it's easy and it's going deeper than the surface level and it's actually working. So I like that. For a limited time, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your first one skin purchase using the code wide open when you check out at oneskin.co. 
You do so much for others. Try One Skin today and do something good for yourself on this Mother's Day. One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspects of aging, One Skin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using code wide open at oneskin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co with code wide open. After you purchase, they'll ask where you heard about them. Please support the show and tell them that we sent you. Thank you. Shopify is the best way to sell online. They truly have your back through every stage of growing and running your business. You can grow your average order value with the Shopify bundles app where you can create and sell product bundles with ease. But guys, my favorite part about Shopify is the app. You can manage your whole site and track sales right from your phone. And typically email marketing can be a challenge, but with Shopify, they make it simple. Shopify removes the guesswork with built-in tools that help you create, execute, and analyze your online marketing campaigns. Plus with Shopify magic, you can whip up captivating content that converts from blog posts to product descriptions, generate instant answers for frequently asked questions and pick the perfect email send time and much, much more. And it's free for all Shopify sellers. If you're on the fence about starting your business, moving online, or have a website with somebody else, look no further than Shopify. It really is one of the most important parts of our business, so we're thankful to be partnered with Shopify. We love using Shopify, and I know that you will too. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash wide open, which is all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash wide open now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash wide open. I launched a personal training uh, uh, fitness piece into a gym and then the owner kind of wanted to like do some weird shit. So I bounced and I took like five of the trainers that were there and I was like, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to people's houses and we're going to train them in their house and we're going to bring the equipment to do that whole thing. So I had like five, five personal trainers that worked for me like eight to 10 hours a day. Like they were just doing crazy amounts of training. Then from there, I actually bought a gym. Um, and then from there, my, my uh, I, I have really good teeth. I don't know why I have good teeth. Let's but see them. <laughs> yeah, those are nice. No braces. No, no. I've never really Same. had a cavity. I haven't either. Same. Yeah. So, so I had been paying dental insurance forever and ever. I went into the dentist like I hadn't been in for like eight years. I went in. Wow. They're like, yeah, everything looks great, man. Nothing. We just did a cleaning and it was like 250 bucks. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. I've been paying dental insurance for eight years and I came in and everything's good and you charged me 250 bucks. Yeah. This is stupid. So I was like, you know what, dude? I'm going to start a dental office. So I told the dentist there, I was like, hey, would you ever be interested in launching a dental office where I ran the business and you just were the dentist? And he was like, sure. What, what are you talking? Dude, I was 23, 24. Um, I was with my brothers, um, and we actually decided like, Hey, let's go in, let's get this dentist to like work for us. Let's build a business with him. Really? And I just told him, I was like, we're not going to take dental insurance. We're just going to do payments. So when someone rolls in, cause dental insurance is total bullshit for everybody listening. Like dental insurance is bullshit. You shouldn't be paying for dental insurance. But so I went in and I was like, we're dude, we're getting rid of that. We're getting rid of it. And we're going to, when people come in, we're going to create a, a, a payment structure. So we would have people roll into the dental office. We'd have the dentist look at them and go, dude, it looks like you got 12 grand worth of work. Well, dude, even with dental insurance, they pay for like 2,500 bucks. Right. That's yeah. it. Like you yeah. don't get very much. Yeah. And then you're like, well, that's it. Everything else is out of my pocket. So most people choose to pull their teeth, which is cheap. It's like three, four, 500 bucks or whatever to pull a tooth. They're just like, just pull it out. I can't, I don't have the money to get it fixed. So what we do is we bring people in, we'd give them their little like, Hey man, you got a lot of work. We got to do it's 12 grand, yada, yada, yada. But we will sign a contract with you for 15 months and you can make monthly payments. So a guy that had $12,000 of work, was like, Oh, 700 bucks a month. That's doable. I can do that. I launched that business. Um, and we did great. It was phenomenal. And then about six months later, I took my first wife in to get her boobs done. Okay. And Got a little bit of money and you were like, yeah, I made a little, yeah, yeah I, I've always made pretty good money, but I, we went in there and I'm just like, I feel like this doctor doesn't know what the hell he's doing. I think he could do a lot more, you know, just a fun fact. The number one and two places in the United States for plastic surgery is Miami and Utah. Really? Yeah. Utah? Utah is surprising. Seemed like a, U, a Utah thing. If you, I dude, Utah, you guys been out there, yeah, but yeah, you've absolutely. only been with it. us like 
one or two times. You haven't been out there a lot, have you? Uh, a couple times. There's a lot of beautiful before, women. There, there, there is. There is. Yeah, and no, it's because they spend a lot of money on their face, their boobs, their whatever. Like, they spend a lot of money. So, anyways, I'm in there with the doctor, and I'm like, hey, dude, uh, would you ever be interested in working together? You you do all the surgery. Let me run the business. Same thing with so my brothers. Same thing as the Same devil. thing, dude. And he was like, yeah, but what you don't understand is that most women that want to get breast augmentations are between 18 and 25, and they don't have any money. So I'm like, okay, cool. What if we finance it? What if we do payments? Mm -hmm. So we I launched this business. It was literally get your boobs done, and it's 300 bucks a month. Wow. And all I could see that yeah, being oh, dude, crush, blew up. Dude. We had, yeah. I think we had like 60 people get a breast augmentation month one. Wow. It was crazy. So from there, I realized that I could build businesses. And then I started a, a energy drink company, social media company, um, a supplement company. Actually, the one I started, I just sold recently. I started a marketing company. I started a detail company. I mean, dude, the list is long to the point where I don't even remember everything. And most so of them, I never, I never spend any money to start. Do you, do you build them up and sell them then? Cause like, how, how can you run yeah. all those? Uh, so that's the thing. That's why people ask me to mentor them. Cause they want to know how I was able to do it. Mm -hmm. Most people don't realize that if you really want to blow your business up, you need to build infrastructure. Right. Most people think of business and they go, Oh shit, I'm going to start a restaurant and I'm going to be the janitor and the waitress and the CPA. And I'm, you got to build infrastructure. Yeah. Every one of my companies, I would hire people to put in the roles that needed to get done. Like, dude, can you imagine if I was in the office with a 19-year-old girl? Like, hey, let's look at your breasts and let's uh, get you a breast augmentation. Yeah, probably, you can't do probably that. wouldn't work. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to have a whole staff. Right. And then I don't want to run the business, so I have to hire a CEO. So now all of a sudden, you start putting in infrastructure and you become the business owner at 30,000 feet rather than the business owner that's like, hey, man, I'm here to do the dishes. Yeah. That's how you do it. How do you find the right people? Hard. That's one of the hardest things you'll ever learn in building anything is okay. finding the right people. It's kind of what we're running into yeah. now. Dude, it's so hard. But, and this is why, again, why I mentor people so much because there's always an answer. It's just usually not what you want to hear. And I'll tell you, it, it may not be what you guys want to hear. The reason it's hard for you to find people is because your leadership ability. Like you are a direct reflection of your company and your employees. And I have people all the time, oh, but I go through employees. I, my employees don't do this. They don't do that. And I go, well, it's because you're not a good leader. Mm -hmm. Like truthfully, it's, it, you must create in yourself a better leader and a better leader creates better employees and better people, right? You could literally take a gypsy off the street and put them into your infrastructure if you are a good leader and get them to become whatever it is that you want to get you them want. to. So what makes a good leader? Oh, that that's a long, long list. But I'll give you one. I'll just give you one. Predictability. You know what mm. you're going to get. Yes. So when I was really young, I played football. I played a little football in college. Um, and I remember listening to, I don't, I don't even remember who it was, but I, I said, what makes a good coach? And Actually, I think it was my football coach, and he said a predictable coach. And I remember thinking, like, well, I don't want you to be predictable because then they know what plays we're running. But I didn't understand the whole thing. Predictability builds a foundation upon where people can build themselves. Mm -hmm. So if I become predictable, I allow everybody in my whole faculty, in my whole infrastructure to understand the principle that this will always be no matter what. One of the worst things you can have as a leader is someone who is emotionally driven, right? Like, what what mood is he in yeah, today? What, are, what yeah. are we getting today? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Get exactly. To the like, I was even talking with Roman Atwood when we were on the boat, and he's like, "Oh man, we have so much trouble with our with our employees." And I said, and "I said, is it because you try to be a friend rather than a boss?" And he's like, "Yeah, absolutely." And I said, "Well, a friend is not predictable. A boss should be. A leader should be predictable." The more predictability I give you, the more you can base everything you're doing and then build. So so when you got somebody who's like, they're all over the place, it's because they don't have a fucking clue where you are. Right. But when I come in and I set boundaries and I live and die by that shit, and no matter what comes my way, you know that what you already know the decisions I'm going to make, right? Like if I'm a fucking idiot, he's going to fire me. He's not going to come in and go, oh, he's having a good day. He's not going to fire me today. Right. He's not going to come in pissed at his wife and fire everybody no matter how good they are. He is a predictable human being. The greatest leader in the world will always be the most predictable. 
no matter what comes, no matter what circumstance, and that's how they build what they want to build with employees galore. Man, I had a boss that was like mm-hmm. so unpredictable. Yep. Like the opposite of what you're saying. You never knew what you were going to get. And it was terrifying. And it was chaos probably. Chaos. It, oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, a bunch of employees coming in and out. Yep. But also hard work. But yep. dude, like every day, just like shaking in my boots he'd fly in or driving in his truck i'm like oh fuck what, yeah what, <laughs> what, what am i getting? in trouble for now yeah and dude how do you ever build rapport how do you build respect how do you build trust you can't build any of that if it's not predictable it's the same thing in a marriage are you guys married no mm-hmm. i'll tell you dude you carry this over as a father and as a husband if you seek to be a good father if you seek to be a good husband you have to be predictable you have to be in a place where you build a foundation of predictability I always give a I always give a story. There was a, a a man. He was with his young child, and they were out on the beach, and they were flying a kite. And the young child says, or no, the the dad says to the child, "Do you know what makes the kite fly?" And you know, the boy, like all of us, is like, "Well, it's the wind, right? The wind makes the kite fly." And the dad's like, "No, it's not the it's not the wind." And and the boy goes, "Yes, it is. It's the wind. Without the wind, we this wouldn't fly." And he goes, "Okay, let go of the string." What does he do? He lets go of the string and the kite crashes. He goes, go grab the string again. Grabs the string, kite takes off again. He was teaching him the lesson of predictability. That string is what allows everything to do its job. It's predictable. It's what holds everything down to allow the kite itself to actually fly. So when you build a business, you build a family, you build, you want to build a, a better leader, you have to find someone who can look at themselves and go, where am I not predictable and where must I become predictable? That's what I need to work on. And then you watch the people who are under your employee, they get better. You watch people coming into your infrastructure, they know, like they're set up and then they can build. We all know that every new hire is never going to crush. But if every new hire has a foundation to build, they will crush. And that foundation is predictability. What do you say to like the kids that are watching right now and uh, they, they don't know, you know, what they want to do with their life? You know, they might have some interest in different avenues, but they know they don't want to be like the normal nine to fiver, but also maybe go to college. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty. What do you have to say to kids like that? I don't know where we as a society took in this like, hey, man, this is how you do it. Go to school, get a degree, get a job, work up in the job, retire. I don't know where we picked that up, but I fucking hate it. I hate it. The truth is, is we're all individuals with capabilities far greater than what we understand. Even as far as you guys have come, you don't really understand your capabilities and you will over time. But if I could, if I had a microphone and I could talk to every young kid, woman or man, don't care, I would tell them you should do everything. You should say yes to everything. And through saying yes and experiencing things, you're going to find out what you love. And then you're going to find out what lights your soul on fire. And when you find out what that is, that's what you should chase. And you should chase it until the fucking day you die. Mm -hmm. And when you do that... That's when you'll make a ton of money. You'll be happy. You'll be successful. You'll do every single thing you ever want to do. I mean, like, look at you guys. You guys could have done a nine to five, but you didn't. You decided to do something that you love and it has taken off and it lights you on fire. Like, dude, your guys' YouTube isn't you guys sitting around going, hey, man, what should we do today? It's like, dude, that looks fun as shit. Let's do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That makes me excited. That's fun. That lights my soul on fire. And you know what's so cool about your YouTube is like you can see it. You convey it in your YouTube. It's like these guys are out riding snowmobiles on water. Why? Look at every one of them. They're all enjoying the shit out of this more (laughs) than you guys are watching it. Yeah. We say yes to everything too. You have to. We still like we're down to try everything and do everything. everything. Yeah. So that's what I would say, man, for those listeners that like, I don't know what I want to do. Let me tell you what not to do. Don't do what everybody else is telling you to do. Don't go to college. Like I'm very, I do not like college. I think college is a huge waste on, on everything. It's so, it's so crazy to me when I come in and say to somebody, Hey man, so I'm a mentor and I can mentor people. I can show you how to get what you want out of this life. And then I can say, this is how much it costs to work with me. And people are like, Oh, I could never spend that. 
but you spent 50 grand on college to get your generals done and leave and go work at Burger King. Yeah, That's nothing fucking yeah. insanity yeah. to right. me, dude. That's what you think is okay because you were programmed to think like, oh, well, dude, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I'm just going to go start spending money, get in a ton of debt, go to school. And then when I get out of school, I'm just probably going to start at a job I could have started and built my way up without school altogether. Yeah, I don't think people that are hiring, at least that I talk to, like really hire based off of college degrees as much as they used to. And no, obviously it really depends the, on it the depends job. It depends the job. But, but yeah, but it's know, very few. And that's the other thing I always tell people too is like, dude, if you want to be a lawyer, go to college. You want to yeah. be a doctor, go to college. You want to, you know exactly what you want. Go do the necessary steps to become that. Mm -hmm. But dude, that's like 2% of people going to school right, right now. Yeah, I mean, Ben and I figured that out while we were in college and then we dropped out you yeah. know the next yeah. day i did the same like, thing you know we don't need this and don't have any money paying for this out of my own pocket and it's like what the fuck are we doing we yeah. want to make it make it have a youtube channel let's go do that yeah you, know? you tried school yeah i played college football where, where at uh in utah okay. at uh at a junior college i was actually going to go play at the university of utah but i didn't have good grades surprise surprise so I went to a JUCO um, that was like the number one in the nation, and I was like, "This is this is awesome! I just want to play football, get my degree, yada yada yada, dude." And then I I I I left. I actually had a crazy story. I actually I didn't get kicked out, but I got arrested. I spent some time in jail for a while. Um, oh damn! Are you yeah. able to say why you got arrested? Yeah, I, I I don't know how long you guys want this podcast to be, so that's why <laughs> okay. I was. So uh, when I was nineteen. I started playing football, went to Snow College. Um, I met my brother, my adopted brother. He's Polynesian. That's why I have Polynesian tattoos. Oh, everywhere. I was wondering yeah. that. That makes sense. Um, I actually named my first daughter after him. Really? Um, yeah, and we met, but it was so funny. In the Polynesian culture, once you leave the house, your parents just kind of like go, it's up to you now, man. Like they don't do the whole like, let's pay for college and help you. And mm -hmm. they kind of send you on your way. Anyways, they had sent him to college to play football, but he was only 17. Well, him and I were at a party one night, and uh, we left the party, came back, went to bed, got up the next morning, and we were sitting out in the foyer, and a girl had come up to us, and she was, like, really distraught. And she was like, hey, um, I think last night at the party I was raped. And we were like, what? What do you mean? She's like, I think I got drugged and raped. So, and my brother's big, like he's much bigger than I am. And he was like, well, who was it? And she told us. So we went to this kid's house and I still remember very vivid. My brother, so the door's in front of me. My brother's on the other side, like waiting, right? And I knock on the door and I'm like, hey, did you uh, rape a girl last night? And I still remember he was like, what's it to you? That's his answer to that? That was his answer. So I remember my brother turned to the corner and hit him. Boom. And my brother, like I said, my brother's big. Knocked him out cold and his roommate slammed the door. So I kicked the door off the hinges, walked into the apartment, and I made all of his roommates come sit in a circle. It was on a second story apartment building. And I threw all their phones out. And my brother like said, get him up. So they got him up and he was like, put your chin up. And I I was like, oh no, I don't know if we should have done this. So he was like, uh, and he would do one punch. He was like bleeding out of his eyes, his he ears. Up, he man. was messed up. My brother's like, put your chin up. <laughs> and he was like, I don't want to. And my brother's like, I'm going to kill you if you don't put your chin up. Holy shit. So he puts his chin up, and my brother uppercuts him. Just boom. I think he hit him one more time, and he was toast. Toast. And I, we looked at all his rooms. We we're like, you tell anybody, we'll kill everybody here. Holy fuck. How old were you at this time? I was 18. He was 17. Okay. So, and this is how stupid I was. We went back to our dorm and we was like, oh, hey, dude, we got football practice in like 15 minutes. Let's get ready for football practice. Throw our gear on, go to practice. Sheriff show up at practice. Th this is how stupid I was. They said, hey, Hoskins, uh, Taya, get over here. And, of course, our coach is like, what the fuck did you guys yeah. do? Right. My dumb ass was like, I don't know. Mm. Like, I didn't even know why we were. I was like, that's how stupid I was. So I we walk over there. They're like, hey, you're coming down to the station with us. Like, 
they handcuff us. And I look over at my brother. I'm like, what are they doing? He's like, are you stupid? I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. We did do that earlier today. They take us down, and they're like, you guys are in huge trouble. Like, this is felonies. You can't break into people's houses and beat the shit out of them, <laughs> right? Anyways, we're there, and my brother, we're both in an interrogation room. My brother starts laughing. He's like, I'm only 17. You guys can't do shit. <laughs> There you and are. they were like, you're 17? Because he was huge again. He looked like a man child. So they haul his ass off to juvie. So I'm there by myself. I'm just like, oh, no, man. Everything, this is horrible. And so I get to jail, and I'm like, can I call my parents to, like, bail me out? And they're like, yeah, you get, you can call them. I call my mom. I'm like, hey, mom, uh, before I even get out, in other words, she's like, why does it say E from County Jail? And I yeah. said, well... We got in a fight. Click. She hung up on me. Wow. So I'm like, all right, dude, I guess we're going to jail. So they put me in my cell. They were like, just so you understand, this is very serious. This isn't like you got in a quick fight. You literally broke into somebody's house and beat the shit out of them. And by the way, you guys are so big. We're charging you with assault with a deadly weapon because you're so big. We're charging you with battery. We're charging you with breaking and entering. Like the list... It was big. I remember going back to my cell and I'm like, holy shit, dude. Well, I'm such an idiot. Like, this is not good, you know? Anyways, long story short, um, we, had, we were able to tell the story of what had happened. Mm -hmm. And then I sat in jail, I think, I don't know, three to five weeks. I was there for a oh, while. Wow. Yeah, I was there for a minute. What's funny is when they went to this kid's house, he had the date rape drug, GHB. Oh, no so that he was... Oh, oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, he did it because like she had then filed, and then yep. like they were like, "What's going on?" What he was what? caught red-handed. Yeah, because yeah. they were like, "Why do these guys do this?" Yeah, yeah. And obviously, she was like, "Yeah, this is what these guys did." Because I'm sure it was valid. When, then. When yeah, those, it was valid. When those 100%. guys called in, they they weren't like, oh, "So <laughs> my buddy might have like raped a chick." They just and said, "No, you guys came yeah." Over they were like, "These guys came in, up. kicked our door in, beat the shit out of us, and then left." Yeah. So, so, of course, they're, like, off the hinges. Like, right. what the hell are I'm sure they doing? didn't want to so hear your that, side of the story, too, no, when you're, like, no, sitting no, no. there. How does that play out? Because, I mean, so I'm sure the police thought you guys were valid. Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever said this on a podcast, this story. I've told a lot of people I've never – I don't know if I've ever shared this story. But, anyway, so, uh, so I'm in jail. They actually bring him in because he's in trouble now. I beat the shit out of him again in, in jail. Like, what? I was so pissed. Oh, yeah. I suppose, because he, like, puts you in. Yeah, there. I'm like, like yeah, so you guys are in the yeah. same cell? No, but oh. they open up your cells for the day, right? right. So, oh, shit. Yeah, so I went in. Anyways, we finally, like, all the little Polynesians in my group there put together their money to bail me out. I get out. They're like, hey, man, you've got court. Like, you got to go to court, yada, yada, yada. Anyways, yeah, I definitely haven't told this story because it's kind of embarrassing. So uh, we're in front of the judge, and I have a public defender because my parents are like, you're done, dude. We don't give a shit. Like, you're an idiot. Public defender was horrible. Anyway, so we go in there. I'm standing in front of the judge. All I hear in front of the judge, hey, I'm taking your time of incarceration of five years and a $25,000 fine. That's what I heard. And I, oh. I was in a chair like this. I was standing while he was, you know, and I passed out. I'm going Five to prison. Years, yeah. So I kind of, like, I didn't go all the way out, but I was like, oh, I got way lightheaded. I like, yeah. And then I remember, like, looking at my lawyer, and my lawyer was like, hey, so when do you want to spend your weekend in jail? Oh. And I was like, what? Weekend? What he said was, I'm taking your time of five years and $25,000 fine, and I'm reducing it to time spent plus another weekend, and you need to pay for the door. The judge had heard the story. I don't know if he sided with us, like he chose for us to be, you know, but he was like, I get it. I understand. Yeah. yeah. So I went back to jail, I think for one more weekend, we had to pay 500 bucks and then we got out and I literally was like, dude, get me out of here. I never, ever, ever want to go to school again. I don't want to like, get me out of here. So, so that's why you wow. dropped out. Yeah. So, that. well, wow. so I left and then I was like, dude, I really got to get my shit together. Like, I have to get my life together. So I was like, you know what? Most Mormons that are good kids go to be missionaries. I'm going to go be a missionary. Like, I need to get my shit together, I right? was wondering why you were 21 when you got Yeah. Because they usually do that at what, 18? So, right so now, so when I went, it used to be from 19 to 21. Now it's 18 and they come home at 20 because it's two years. 
So I took the next six months and I was like, hey, I promise you I'm a better person. I want to go be a missionary, yada, yada, yada. On my mission, I was dumb as shit, but that's where I began <laughs> to understand personal development and like growing. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was like two months in, two months in, I, I met somebody from a different faith, Jehovah's Witnesses, what uh, Whistling Diesel oh, used yeah, to be. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, dude, that's they, an interesting. Yeah, dude, it's, a, it's an interesting faith, but they like to Bible bash with you. Mm -hmm. Well, dude, they started Bible bashing with me. I didn't know shit. I looked so stupid. Oh, really? Like oh, going head to head? Oh, dude, they want, that's what they want to so do. They like want to Bible bash with you. Battle? Wait, like with, with what? You have like with more the, information? Like yes. So, they, so what you it? do is you say, well, the Bible says this, so you're not doing that. And I said, well, the Bible says this, and you're not. That's what a Bible bash is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which a lot of people do it. God, and, it's like a Bible off. Yeah, exactly. It really <laughs> is. So, dude, Where do you I, do that? On, on the street, on anywhere, the street? man. On so the like, street, you're, you, cause you're, you're knocking on, doors. on doors. Like everyone's going to and doors, Jehovah's right? witnesses knock on doors. So right. sometimes you run into them on the oh, street. Oh my God. Yeah. I can't imagine <laughs> like suburban wherever oh, you are. Wait, so crazy. you started Bible bashing with a Jehovah witness. Yeah. And they destroyed me. Really? Cause I didn't know anything, dude. I'm like, well, I'm going to be a missionary. I don't know anything stupid. Well, I left that altercation and I was like, I will never. I will never lose another religious debate when it comes to the Bible. Well, because usually when somebody's beefing with you, you can just beat the shit. Yeah, out exactly. Of right? But, so yeah, but, not anymore. Beat up but yeah, no, I could. Yeah, you're like, oh, I could. I'm gonna punch you so bad. Which I actually ended up doing a, a few times on my mission. Really? I, <laughs> yeah, like like my first day on a mission. You guys have seen missionaries. They're goofy looking, right? They got the white white shirt and tie. There they got. Well, dude. I went from being the king at my high school to being the king at my college to going on a mission looking goofy as shit. Dude, my first area I was in, we were assigned to bikes. We didn't get a car. Mm. So picture this, dude. Me in a white suit and tie, hair combed, clean shaven on a fucking bike <laughs> <laughs> with my helmet on, dude. <laughs> I had a helmet. A helmet oh, too? dude. They I made had, you wear it? Yeah, or? that's oh, rules, man, bro. That's Those are the rules. So I'm wearing a helmet looking goofy as shit, dude. Like day one, I'm on the street. I'm with my new companion, right? And he's like supposed to teach me all this stuff. And we walk up to somebody who I don't know what he had to have had mental issues. I don't know. But he starts yelling at us like, oh, don't you start telling me about like uh. Mormons have this, like just talking mad shit on us. And I remember looking at my companion and he was like, yeah, dude, a lot of people it's hate, kinda, kinda a lot of people right. hate us, but you know, you got to learn. And I remember looking at my companion. I was like, no, no, he's going to learn today. <laughs> So I walked up to him. I said, as a missionary, I said, you know who the fuck you're talking to? And he was like, <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Did a missionary just swear at me? And I was like, yeah, what were you just saying? And he was like, well, you guys. And as soon as he opened his mouth, I bitch slapped him. I just, <laughs> what? Bitch slapped him. Took my coat off. I had a suit on. I took my jacket off, set my bike down. I was like, you're going to learn today, bitch. And he kind of like stumbled around. And I said, what are you going to do? <laughs> Spit in his face. I'm like, do something. Dude, I was stupid. I, I was such a dumb young kid. The name's starting to line up. Yeah. Dude, the name's <laughs> the starting so, to line up. <laughs> makes sense. So anyways, it's so funny. It's like it was dude, in he a had movie. To have, he had to have been like, I'm going to become a Mormon yeah, after you. Oh, he went he with. You he signed, signed up Mormon right after that. Dude, but the thing was is I guarantee you he never did that again to any yeah, mission. Oh, for sure that not. Anybody. But so anyways, I... Uh, it's so funny. Dude, your, your companion had to have been oh, like, dude, dude, had to have been bro, like, oh, not you, can't, you can't just beat the shit out of everyone that dude, doesn't he, want to be a Mormon. He started to cry, my companion. like Because he was scared or what? Well, he was just like, you can't do this, man. Oh, man. Like, this just looks so bad. And I'm like, I don't give a fuck about it. <laughs> oh, dude, I was, and he was like way righteous. He was such a good dude. <laughs> so anyways, while I'm like ready to just keep going ham on this, uh, like, let's a member of our guy. church drove up. It was on a street, a main street. Like I'm in the middle of the street beating the shit out of somebody. Member she rolls up in a minivan, kicks the doors open. He's all, elders, get in. <laughs> we got in and we left. He peeled out. Oh, yeah, dude, we get back to there and my companion calls. You have what's called a mission president. My mission president calls me. He says, "Hey, uh, we gotta have a conversation." And I'm like, oh, "I'm gonna go home, dude. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get sent home from being a missionary. What a dipshit I am, you know." He comes down. And he's like, "Hey, man, listen. I'm only giving you this pass one time. Don't do that again." And I was like, no. "Okay, I promise I won't do that again." So, anyways, the next day. Yeah. <laughs> So, so because of the altercation with the Jehovah's Witnesses, I was like, I'm never, ever going to look stupid again. So I memorized the whole Bible. 
word for word, which is a lot, right? Wow. I spent two years, three hours a day, like memorizing, memorize. I started just memorize scriptures that, that, that I would bash with, and then it turned into just memorizing Knowing everything. everything. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you were like, you were bashing every day then? Oh, I was bashing everybody. You were like, you were going, like, you were going out of your way? Oh, yeah, dude. Going at, down at the, the Jehovah At the end of my streets. mission, so I, so I was a missionary in Seattle. At the end of my mission, I was on the University of Washington campus, and they would invite me in to the uh, religious studies classes, and they would try to grill me, and I'd answer everything. Boom, 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 boom. Just answer a Bible everything. battle. Yeah, because I knew the scriptures really well. But because of that, I started to actually become smart. Right. Like when you memorize that much stuff, your brain starts working. Right. You know, well, I then was like, you know what I want to do when I get home? I want to be a doctor because I literally like I started to learn and I was like, oh, yeah. So I thought you were like dumb, like growing up or just not good at school. No, dude, I was stupid. I don't know if I had like some kind of autism. Maybe I still do. But I was not smart. A little bit of the tism. Yeah, a little bit of the tism. Yeah. So anyways, I, I come home and I was like, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to be a doctor. So I go back to school. I'm there for like 20 minutes. I start talking to a few doctors. I actually got into pre-med stuff. I started working with doctors. And I specifically remember I said every doctor I met all said the exact same thing. Even ones that were in medical school, they would say, if you're here for the money, don't do it. And I was like, yeah. well, I do want to make money. Yeah. And everyone, I'm like, don't do it, don't do it, don't. And so I left, and I never, ever went back to school. Why do you think they were saying don't do it? Because no doctor in the world will tell you that he has money and time. He'll yeah. just tell you he has money. And I don't care about money if I don't have time. That's mm. no good. Yeah. Especially just the commitment to get to that level. Oh, right? dude, I mean, you're talking about 12 yeah. years, especially if you're a specialist. And then, like, my plastic surgery doctor, that guy was working 10 hours a day was he rich absolutely he was did he have time for his family no did he have time to spend his money no did he have time to do anything no i didn't want that i didn't want that life you're probably too big to be a doctor anyway yeah i mean it it wouldn't have worked (laughs) way more rich now too like i mean being a owning a successful business versus being a medical doctor yeah most of the time, the successful businesses make it. Absolutely. Because that's what you want money. as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Like, you guys want time and money. You want you don't want money. You're just working for someone, too, most of the time. Yep. So What's yep. interesting is you, as we kind of, like, work through your life, where you're like, yeah, when I was young, you fought to, like, make a, make a point. Yeah. Right? And then you realize that that wasn't the best way. And then you're yeah. like, all right, now I'm going to try using words to yep. get my point across. And then now how you've transitioned that into helping people. Yeah as being a mentor that's pretty cool like a a maturing thing you know that like we're all going through now as we grow up when you talk about leadership and stuff like that i mean it's also amazing how much stuff you've done i mean like you have these stories and it all reroutes back to your advice to people too saying go out and say yes and try all these things because like it it really is backed by it's your history too you know like like it it, that's why you have lines up that's why you got to say yes because if you don't say yes, you don't experience. If you don't experience, you don't learn. If you don't learn, you're never going to go anywhere you want to go. Yeah. You know, I actually have a little bit of a story to saying yes to because uh, when we were first starting out, like, we were always grinding and we were we were doing it ourselves too, you know. Like, we were printing our own T-shirts, pack yeah, them up, ship them, all this. And, like, I, uh, I didn't have a girlfriend or anything. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I need to start saying yes to more stuff and just going, like, when someone calls me and wants to go golfing or whatever, you know, that same day, uh, it was so weird. My girlfriend, who I have now been dating her for five years, she called me just out of the blue because we had like met through a friend and was like, hey, do you want to come on this party bus with me? We like, we got to dress up or whatever. I need a date. I normally would say no to that because like, I didn't really want to go do that. Yeah. But I was like, I'll, I'll say yes. And now, you know, works out. You wrote a book called like going to self or going to war with yourself after a divorce? Uh, it's called The Divorce Handbook, and then it's How to Go to War with Yourself. Uh, what, did, what did you take away? From, like, What's the story on that? Yeah. When I was 21 to 27, I was in a marriage to a wonderful person. She's still a great person. Um, and I wasn't fully committed. I just wasn't. I was working on businesses. I was working on growing my empire. I was working on a TV show. I was doing all kinds of things that were more important because as a man, what's most important I have to provide. And I never realized this principle that I'm teaching you guys. So I got divorced um, and it was hard, dude. It was really, really hard. Divorce is very, very hard. But I realized through my divorce, because I may be the dumbest person in the room, but I'm also the first to learn the quickest. 
So I got divorced. I learned what I needed to learn. I then went, you know what, dude? I'll bet you there's so many people that are going through what I went through that did it the wrong way. And I want to be able to share with them a better way to do it. The reason it's called going to war with yourself is because if you want to become something greater, if you want to become the greatest version of yourself, you're going to have to go to war with the current version. So in the book, it's all about you being able to look in the mirror and go, hmm, you're the fucking problem and you're the solution. So that means you need to fix this. And that's what the whole entire book is about. But again, that's again why it set me out to like, all right, dude, I got to work on me because I'm an mm. idiot. And then whenever I took in new information, I clung to it until I decided if it was the right information. Like if you want to change, the number one thing I say to people, if you want to change, it's all about information gathered. New information is what changes you. Nothing else will change you. Nothing else. Like, for example, if I want to get in shape and I don't know how to get in shape, then new information teaching me how to get in shape is how I'm going to do it. If I want to make more money, then new information teaching me about how to make more money is what's going to do it. I'm not going to haphazardly go, oh, shit, I hit the jackpot. Right. You know? So, anyways, I wrote that book, and it was really just therapy for me. But then going back through it, I was like, dude, this is all about personal development and growth. And that's what the whole book is on. Like, a lot of what we've even talked about today is in that book. So, it really didn't, it didn't have much to do with divorce. It was just explaining that you are the problem and having to take accountability. And I think that goes with a lot of things. If you fail at, you know, what could you have done differently? Yeah. What do you have to say to all like the hate type comments like you just posted one on your story the other day that was like this is all phony bullshit like you're not actually successful this is all just a facade yeah what do you say to those people uh i don't say anything i don't care I, I, the sooner you as a human being learn to not give a fuck about other people's opinions, the sooner you become untouchable. And the sooner you become untouchable, the more successful you become. Plain and simple. Gary V, uh, he said it really well. He said, as soon as a compliment doesn't affect you, neither will an insult. Because everybody's always like, oh, I don't give a fuck about what people say. And then they hear compliments. They're like, oh, that feels yeah. so great. It's like, well, Why? You are focused on people's opinions, whether it's good or bad. You are focused on their opinions. So I got into this place a while back where I was like, listen, I'm not saying fuck you when you give me a compliment. That's not what I'm saying. But your compliment means as much to me as your insult, which is nothing. I do not give a shit. And I get a lot of hate, man. I get a lot of hate. And it's a lot of what you're polarizing on Instagram, it seems. Yeah, I I, well, dude, it's because, again, the first thing we talked about, people are like, who's the muscle? Like, you're a fucking douche. You only made money because you had a TV show, you know. So I get a lot of hate, but I don't give a shit. About what people nothing like you're all your compliments in the world although they're great and i you say them they, they don't mean anything to me to somebody who's coming to you at hate it's like dude there's nothing for me to say which is another thing that i learned when i would bible bash it's like dude you can bible bash till you're blue in the face i could tell you all the reasons why your religion's wrong my religion's right why your perspective is wrong why mine is right it doesn't matter it doesn't do anything mm-hmm. so why take any energy to worry about what the fuck other people say yeah it's true. Sometimes an opinion isn't worth changing. No. Dude, when's the last time that you ever had an argument with somebody and then they leave going, you know <laughs> yeah. what? You're right. Never. No kidding. Right. It's 100%. never happened in ever. the history of man. It's never happened. Now, I will say when you start bringing the level of people around you up, that actually does change. Like when you get around good people like you guys, you get around people who have their shit together. Like we could have a conversation where you like the marriage, right? Mm -hmm. We could have a conversation that you may not agree with or you don't even know if you agree with it. But when you're with a higher vibration of people, those people will go, huh, I should think about that. And they're open to the idea. I'm, I love those conversations. Those conversations are great. But but the rest of them. Well, you plant the seed. Yeah. Plant the seed. And we actually just had this conversation the other day of like arguments never really end with with like you're right, man. But it does leave you to think about something. Yep. And sometimes that's good. If you're if, if you're not close, minded if you're not close minded, but yeah, most people are close minded. Yeah. No one ever leaves an argument and they're like, oh, that guy was really right. I'm really grateful for his input. Yeah. No one does yeah. that unless you're with a higher vibration of people, which is very, very small, a very mm-hmm. minute amount of people 
they leave, like I'll leave conversations with some really great people of things I don't agree with. And I'll go, I'm going to, I'm really going to pull, pull that over. I'm going to think about that. Like mm-hmm. I really liked his point of view. I may not agree with it right now, but I'm going to think on it, which is very rare. I think the older that I get, the more I understand where certain people come from, even though I don't completely agree with them. Yeah. But you know, like the w- world makes a little bit more sense, like the more you experience it. Yeah. So you can always tell like why certain people vote a certain way or, yep. or why they donate and, and don't care about money, but they care about relationships. Like, yeah. you know, the more you experience with just life in general, yep. the more it makes sense. Dude. And that's, what's so powerful when you want to become like crazy powerful if you can lead everything you do with understanding, you always become the most powerful person in the room. Now, this is going to sound crazy, but like I understand suicide bombers in Afghanistan. Do I agree with them? No, but I do understand them. You know why I understand them? Because they were raised in an atmosphere that taught them exactly what they believe to the core and they genuinely to their core believe that what they're doing is right. right. Now, I may not think it's right and it may not be right. <laughs> yeah. But I at least understand them. And so in my help. understanding, I then bring my power because I go, oh, I can understand why. And the more that you're able to understand every situation and every person, the more powerful you become because then you can dictate the conversation the way that it needs to go according to the understanding. If I can't understand you, I can't even talk to you. I can't communicate with you. Nothing ever happens. And then you just have a stupid ass argument where you're like, dude, you're a fucking idiot. You're a fucking idiot. All right, let's get out of here. But when you have an actual conversation or an argument with somebody and you understand them first, oh, dude, there's there's a lot of power to that. How do you understand who to take advice from? How do you I decide only the take advice from people who are living the life that I want. I wouldn't take one lick of advice from Warren Buffett. I wouldn't take any advice from a lot of people because they do not have the life that I want. I will listen to a man on the street if he has something that I desire Mm -hmm. because I want to know how he got it. Like that's the number one question I get in my DMs. How, How do I find a mentor? How do I find somebody to help me find someone who's doing exactly what you want to do and pay them to tell you how to do it quicker than you will be able to do it on your own. It's crazy, dude. I I get into some places with some very powerful people that you would think I'd be like, oh, shit, let me write all this shit. This is great advice. If you're not living the way that I want to live, if you don't have what I seek, then I'm not fucking listening to you. It's interesting. CJ and I were just talking about that. There's people, you know, these people have, like, gigantic amounts of success and big businesses and stuff like that go, but... We go, I don't know if, if I'd want that Fuck type of no. if that yeah. type of business. I would not want to be Mr. Beast. Yeah. Like, like that, Beast. that sounds terrible. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, dude, I said I, that. I wouldn't want to be the president. I wouldn't yeah. want it, like the amount of re- responsibility yeah. and just like the wear and t- I do not want that at all. Yeah. So find out in your life what you want, man. I mean, you guys are already very successful, but what's the next level and what does the next level look like? And I would find somebody who's in that next level. That's the only person I would take advice yeah. from. Mm hmm. I wouldn't listen to shit else, dude. Like, I'm going to go to the best doctor in the world and go, hey, man, can you tell me how to uh, buy a house and uh, and how to make a ton of money? No, because you're working 24 hours a day. I don't want to hear anything from you. That's. I feel like that's a great question because that's what a lot of people, okay, if I need help, who do I go to? Well, find the motherfucker that has the life you want. If I wanted to become young and have a ton of fun and build a YouTube channel, you guys are the first people I'd be like, hey, bro, how much is it going to cost for me to sit down with you on a weekly or a monthly basis and pick your brain for an hour? And then you go, yeah, man, it's going to be 10 grand. Here you go. And I would pay that shit immediately. I would take notes like crazy and I would build exactly what you guys are building and I would do it in way less time than I would be able to do it myself. Yeah, it's crazy how much heartache you can skip and just waste of time by just asking somebody who's already done it exactly i this is what i say about mentors a mentor a good mentor a mentor will take years and turn them into months and months and turn them into days that's it there's nothing else to a mentor that's what it will do so experience in life usually takes a long time 
well, why not find the cheat code? Hey, dude, this is what I'm doing. My mentor is going to go, yeah, I did that, man. This is what you should do. And don't do this because I did this and it cost me this much money. And it took me this much time to get it figured out. Mm-hmm. That's why, dude. Like, that's the whole thing. Like, oh, okay, man, I want to have this. I want to have it as quickly as possible. I know I need to invest and I'm going to, and I'm going to have it way quicker than I could do it myself. Yeah, we, uh, for the longest time, didn't have like a single person that was like in our realm mm-hmm. of what we were doing to like ask questions, you know, skip the the wasteful yep. probably four years of our yeah, life yeah. of just like four years of just, figuring it out. Just spinning the tires, you know, mm-hmm. not really getting any traction. And then slowly we started to figure it out. But just like getting to sit down with other people yeah. that are doing it, but on an actual like extreme scale. Well, dude, think about how cool it would have been if you guys could go back to that kid and tell him everything you know, how quick he would have done it rather than wasting four years. Oh, yeah. Could have saved him a ton and of how much, <laughs> and how, <laughs> a ton of Dude, and how much money would you spend to have that knowledge? You'd be like, dude, I'll pay you anything because I know that through your these efforts, I'm going to make a shit ton of money, so I'll pay you whatever. Yeah. yeah. It, I mean, it's basically just like college. It, like, exactly. It's, yeah. it's kind of like the college thing too. I think that all the time of like kids that spend, you know, 50 grand on college and then, they're not willing to spend 500 bucks on a something to start their business. Exactly, which is insanity to me, dude. I see people all the time. Oh, man, that's a huge investment. It's like, wait, you just spent $75,000 that you got nothing for that you're going to spend the next 20 years to pay off? Yeah. And you're yeah. telling me that having a mentor or having somebody help you is not worth it? You're a yeah. fucking idiot. It's because society has been just like trained to think that college is like such a safe yep. bet. But it's really, it's not. No. mm it's the worst thing you could possibly do if you do not have purpose and like a path. I also don't think that being an employee is bad though. Like, no, the, I don't the, either. The no. world, you know, needs that too. And like, and not everyone is meant to be like an entrepreneur. And that's a hard and a, conversation yeah. to have, and but a it's business true. Owner, and it's just like, it's the truth. Like, yep. I, I think, uh, like I, I tell my girlfriend that too. Like she's like one of the hardest working people I know, but like, she's not, that much of a savage yeah. and like you kind of just got to be like yeah. in business and uh i'm like you i think are too nice yeah. to be like a, a business owner yeah. like that you know you gotta snap necks and cash checks sometimes yeah it, well dude this is what i would say because a lot of people ask can anybody be an entrepreneur the answer is yes but there are entrepreneurs that are born and then there are some that can be made not a lot but there are some but it's a really really quick test and it's this would you rather sink on your own ship or sell on somebody else's? And my answer is I will sink on my ship all day long before I sell on somebody else's ship. Yep. And that's why I have to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. Some people just know. Yeah. Or if you're like, dude, I just want to sell and I'll row the fucking boat. It, so I'm good to be an employee. And dude, employees make nothing good wrong money. with no, that. No, there's, there's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with that. Because there, there's, you know, people always think, yeah, you're not making like the same money, but like you're trading, you're trading money for your freedom, for your ease of mind, yeah. mm-hmm. for relaxing, for time off. Like, yeah, oftentimes, it's like what what matters more to you, yeah. you know? Oftentimes running a business isn't as luxurious. I it's mean, I'd say most never, of the time it's not as luxurious never. as it, 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 the idea of it, you know? Yeah. And when you're looking at most people that own a business and you're like, I should start, you're looking at someone who's successful. So you're like, man, they got to like yep. paid, you know, but the the amount of work to get there and still the stuff they deal with behind the scenes. Yep. I, I tell people, if you were to liken both of them, being an employee is running a marathon and being an entrepreneur is sprinting. That's what it is. Like it's a lot harder in the beginning and then it's over or you take the route of, I'm just going to do this consistently for the rest of my life and I'm going to make a, Good amount mm-hmm. of money and I don't have to fucking kick the shit out of myself because yep. you guys know you guys are all entrepreneurs. Yeah. You know, yeah. like you could have gotten a job doing something making great money and it would have been a great stretch and you would have ran a great marathon and you could have made good money. But you didn't want to do that. So you're like, I'm going all in. I'm sprinting my balls off. And I don't know how long I'm going to sprint for, but I'm going to be done much quicker than I retired at 65 and then I lived the rest of my life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think. I think we're all pretty exhausted because we're in that sprint. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just like going. It's so much harder. Every time I have this conversation, you have to say, dude, 
being an entrepreneur is not what you think it is. It is so much harder than you think it's going to be. It just is. I don't give a shit how glorified you think you've seen someone's told you. It's fucking harder than you are going to expect. Well, dude, and that's it was easy. It, Everyone would do it. Yeah, and, and it does suck, but it goes back to what you said at the beginning. Like, if you find something that you enjoy, you know, yeah. double down on it, triple Absolutely. down on it, go all in on it. So, like, if you enjoy the process of it, it makes the suck a lot less. Yeah. And it sucks. Like at the end of the day, it's like so stressful, a lot of work. But also if you're doing something that you enjoy, it makes it a lot a lot better. Dude, it's a it's a game changer. When you find something as an entrepreneur that you enjoy, like even when you don't make money in the beginning, you're like, but I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. I, I always like to give that like preface. I don't ever dog on uh nine to fivers because we need them. Also to build the infrastructure we have in the United States was done by tradesmen and tradesmen are nine to fivers essentially. And fuck, I'm grateful for them. Like they're the best. Those are the best men on this planet. I'm not saying to them, Hey, you suck. Cause you didn't start your own business. Like, no, that's not the case because there is a distinction between dude, I will build and I'll build for somebody else and I'll make my nest egg and I'll be happy doing it. And then there's people like me. That's like, dude, I could not, could not listen to somebody else tell me what to do. I just can't do it. It's not in my brain. It doesn't work. So I guess I'm stuck with one option. I have right. to be an entrepreneur. Where Everyone's you, needed. Everyone's important. Yeah. Where do you think the helicopter flying, fast driving, strong individual that you are, where did that come from in yourself? Like when you were growing up, did you always know you, were you always trying to be different or where, where did that come from? So I told you guys my dad died at 21. Mm -hmm. um, when he died, he was 47 years old, which is crazy because that's like 10 to 12 years from where I am now. Um, I was with him. I was actually holding his hand when he died, and I spent the last week with him, and it was a deathbed kind of thing. My dad had regrets, and the only thing that he regretted was things that he hadn't done, not things that he had done. Like your regrets at your end of life will only be the things you hadn't done. It will not be the things you did. It just won't. Mm -hmm. It won't. It literally will be a look back and go, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I do that? So when I had those conversations at such a young age and then I watched him die early, in my brain, I almost put my time clock to 47. Like, oh, well, I guess I'm only going to live to 47. And so in that, I was like, you know what, dude? I got to live this life as hard and as fast as I can. I need to do everything and experience everything because I just don't know how long I'm going to live for. I just don't. And so I want to experience everything. If I like it, I'll keep doing it. If I don't like it, I'm not going to do it. But my taste for, or my hunger even, hunger is a better word, my hunger to do everything has been with me since I was 21 years old. And so I will do everything everything and then if i like it i keep doing it if i don't i'm like all right that's up let's go on to the next thing that's really where it started are you afraid of death um it's funny you ask this i think about death every day um i'm not afraid to die i'm afraid i'm afraid to leave my children fatherless that's what i'm afraid of it was really hard for me i was the oldest of five siblings um, I was 21. My youngest was 11 and it sucks. Mm -hmm. It sucks not having a dad. Um, every time there's a great experience, even today on the boat, um, my mom, my mom was there, you know, I, I flew us all in on a private jet. We got a big Airbnb for tons of money. We booked the yacht. We did the race. And today my mom was like, your dad would have loved this. Like he would have just eaten it. He's, she said specifically, she said he would have been crazy to see you race yesterday. And it sucks because all the greatest moments of my life are always still held down by, I wish my dad was here. It's funny when my, all my children are born, I go through two phases, tons of joy and tons of sorrow. Because I immediately feel having a child, which is the most beautiful experience ever. I feel it. And then the first thing I go to is, I wish my dad was here. And it really pisses me off that he's not here. So dealing with that, 
I've come to terms that I don't know how long, long I'm going to live for. I live my life according to like, dude, this could be the last thing I do. This could be my last podcast. I'm not afraid to die. I'm afraid for my children to have to go through what I went through missing my father. And that is a very, very real fear. Like my wife, my children, like growing up the way I've grown up mm-hmm. without a dad, you know, like that, that sucks. Does that play an effect on like your decisions that you make? Every single day. Every single day, every one of my decisions is derived off of one fact. Um, you guys know who Marcus Aurelius was? Uh, part of the Roman Empire, long, long time ago. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was a philosopher. Uh, he was part of, I mean, he was like the man. He was the shit. You guys have heard of Stoicism? Mm-hmm. You ever yeah. heard of the word Stoicism? That yeah. It came yes. from Marcus Aurelius and those types of men. Um he, he wrote in his journal while he was growing up, and it was a journal we weren't ever supposed to get, but somehow we have it. Anyways, we have these crazy cool writings from Marcus Aurelius. One of the things he says is that a man should contemplate death every single day, and what that does is it puts him in the right perspective, and in the right perspective, you make the right decisions. So with my dad dying, that just became a part of my life. I never have spent a day in my life not thinking about death and when it's coming, and then... I tell people like an added piece to that, you should also contemplate the death of those you love the most because it puts you in the right perspective. Like Mm -hmm. death is the greatest teacher. So every decision I make, every decision I make is a derivative of the thought that what if today's the last? What if this is her last day? What if this is my last day? How will I make this decision? So everything is tied to it. I think about that a lot. What would my family do? And it makes, it's like so hard to think about. Yeah. Like what would, but what as, would their reactions be? as dark as it is, it's also beautiful. Uh, one of my favorite people who I have a good relationship with, do you guys know who Tim Grover is? He was Michael Jordan's coach. He was Heard Kobe Bryant's coach. Name, yeah. He, he speaks at some of my events and one of my events, he said, you must go into the darkness to find your light and thinking on death is that darkness. So for me, I, that's like literally the second thing I do every day. I go into, I wake up, I go right into like, I'm so grateful for everything, my gratitude. Second thing I do is I start contemplating death. I contemplate my death, my wife's death, and my children's death. I think about it because then it puts me in perspective. And in the right perspective, I make all the choices that I would make if I was laying on my deathbed. If it was your mm. last day. Yeah. It's a good thing to put that in decisions of your life. But then it's tough too when you're doing things that scare you. I guess I'm putting it in something physically like the race. Yeah. You know, your chances of, of something catastrophic happening are really small. Yeah. So it's like, but it could do, happen. Do you say no to those things because you're worried about it? That's not the right way to live your life. You have to make these experiences for yourself. You shouldn't wake up every day and go, well, okay, I, I don't want, I want to be here for my kids. So I'm going to sit here in this bed and do nothing. No, because I want to be there. So that's the thing. So so if you remember, I said, you don't regret the things you did. You regret the things you didn't do. Mm -hmm. So if I was laying on my deathbed tomorrow, I'd be like, dude, why didn't I do that race? Exactly. With all my friends and all these cool people. Like same thing. When you guys ask me to come to the podcast, like why, why, why didn't I do that podcast with those dudes? They're such good dudes. Like, why didn't I do the podcast? Well, I was with my family. I was busy. I was. No, dude. What if I died tomorrow? Like, I want to I want to have a podcast with these guys. I want to yeah. do shit. So then I go back to, like, that's actually the opposite. Mm-hmm. Well, it scares me I shouldn't do it. Like, your boy who got in the helicopter, it was like, I don't want to get it. It scared the shit out of him. Dude, but if he had never gotten a helicopter and he laid on his deathbed and they were like, dude, remember when you should have went in the helicopter? He's like... Now that I'm laying here on my deathbed, might be, might be. I think he would still be. <laughs> I think he would still, still be like, no. he, "Thank God I didn't do that." <laughs> well, no, but the thing is, is like he you really. I mean, it's so easy to say that, but man, mm-hmm. people shift so fast when death is there. Mm-hmm. And and again, like laying on your deathbed, knowing tomorrow's the last day, it's like, why didn't I get in the helicopter? I had a cool opportunity to fly in a Black Hawk, and I'm going, and I'm dying, and I didn't do it. You said that to him. I did. You you literally said that to yeah. him. There's footage of, of him <laughs> going, well, what if you died tomorrow? Yeah. Then, then you would regret it. And Evan goes, well, I don't think I would. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He did. Yeah. yeah. But if he was forced to be in that position, I guarantee you it would change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why it's so crucial to do that kind of stuff because then it gives the real answers. Otherwise, you end up this scared bitch the rest of your life and you don't do what you would have done. Mm-hmm. You know, 
like, like again, I was scared as hell yesterday in the race. Yeah. I've never really done an oval race with guys that are going to be bumping. I was like, dude, what if I died? What if I car rolls? What if I light on fire? I don't need this. Yeah, <laughs> like, what am I doing? And I'm like, no, dude, I'm here on a racetrack with my friends doing some fun, fun yeah. ass shit. Why would I not do this? Yeah. Why would I not be here? I don't want to go to the grave and not do this. This is cool as shit in front of 10,000 people. Oh, dude, this is the best. It is cool, especially when... We're in the opportunities that we're like so blessed to have. Oh yeah. Like, can you imagine telling your, you know, 21 year old self, like, Hey, this is going to be your life. And this is going to be the opportunities that you have, but you're not going to take any of them because you're a pussy ass bitch. Yeah. yeah like that, <laughs> yeah. like you'd be like, what? no, no, oh. no. What do you mean? You no. would be like, wait, I was given the opportunity to do that. And I didn't. Yeah. That's why even, you know, as, as like crazy as he was about the helicopter, I'm telling you right now, how many people get to get in a Blackhawk and go on a roller coaster ride? <laughs> Yeah, up. How That's many people? Too, Dude, too. if you went back to him five years ago and were like, hey, bro, you're going to hang out with Heavy D. He's going to take you in a Blackhawk and he's going to roller coaster you through the desert. Dude, me one year ago, I would have shit. Yeah. I would have, I would, it would have blown my mind. Yeah. Bro. I said but here are no the way. coolest opportunity is ever. And he almost didn't do it because he was yep. a scared bitch about it. I know. <laughs> it's wild. You're one of the few about. people to call Evan that in recent yeah. history. Well, I said that to I said, listen, man, I know you do a lot of crazy stunts, but you're going to be a bitch if you don't get in this helicopter. <laughs> it's it's good for him is. to hear that. Every yeah, he has to. Yeah. Yeah. He had the opportunity last night and he, he uh, pulled out. That's all right. That's <laughs> all right. You know why I like that is because he did it. He decided it wasn't for him, and then he moved on. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah, but what if, what if he was like, dude, it was the greatest experience of my life, and I want to do it every day, and he bought a helicopter, he and he had the greatest, Black coolest helicopter. life ever because he got in a helicopter? It's true. I'm sure that happens a lot where people are Absolutely. Like deathly afraid that they try it, and then that becomes that, their profession. That was me. That. The reason I was talking to him is because I was exactly like him before I got in a helicopter. I was the same way. Afraid to oh, go dude, I still... I don't like to go very high in the helicopter. I am deathly afraid of, of flying. But there is nothing in this world that is the same feeling of getting behind the controls in the air and flying with birds. There's nothing. Oh, God, but I, I had, one so but I had yeah, to do it. Buzzing right now. But Dude, I, I believe it. it. Uh, it's so sick. That's but interesting if, that you say you're scared of flying or you have fears of flying because I figured once you started i would like to get my pilot's license and i don't i don't dislike flying yeah i hop in a plane i'll fall right asleep it's all good yeah but i don't think i would like being behind the controls and i like being in control yeah you guys know i'll drive 16 hours all day because i don't like to give up control yeah but i didn't i worried about that that i go well what if my fear of flying doesn't go away and i'm a bad pilot because of it yeah you would actually be a better pilot from it because the fear is what gives you discipline to become something really good at mm -hmm. it i mean dude that's why i'm going to be a great pilot and be able to do crazy stuff because of my fear like heavy d doesn't have any fears he does a lot of shit he probably shouldn't do because he's not afraid of anything mm -hmm. dude for me i am like i'm looking at every caution i'm looking at every piece i'm checking every part of the machine like i'm looking over everything and dude i still am afraid of flying even flying over on the Gulf Stream that we flew over, like I'm in the back hitting turbulence, and I'm like, oh, shit, mm -hmm. I hate this idea. Like, I don't like it, but I love to fly a helicopter almost more than anything else, so that's what I do. And I was him. Mm -hmm. I was like, dude, I don't, don't put me in a helicopter. I don't Because like I was watching him, I'm like, I know exactly what he's feeling because I know exactly how I would have reacted. It would have been the same exact way. But because I said yes to it and I flew and, and Heavy D got his first helicopter and I got behind the controls, I was like, oh, my gosh. I get it. This now. is the this greatest is thing on the earth. I've driven everything with a motor and nothing touches flying a helicopter. It doesn't. <laughs> that, Fuck yeah. you, Ryan, dude, for taking that dream away from me. I tried Wait, why win, did he dude? take it away? Because he was supposed to win the helicopter. I was supposed to win oh. last night. Oh, And yeah. I told you him don't want, to, dude. You don't want that helicopter. Yeah, that's, that's one thing. After hanging out with you guys. Like I've said it so many times, I just got home and was like, damn, I didn't know that I needed a helicopter until hanging out with mm -hmm. these guys. Yep. Yeah, it's so motivating. Like when we went there, I came back just like after being around everyone. I was like, man, like we need to pick fired it up. up. Yeah. Like yeah. I was fired up, like yeah. ready to go, you know, like yeah. the Utah trip with Heavy D and yeah. Cleet and, and Whistling and all those guys. Like, you know, you feel like a big fish until you get into a big pond and you're like, oh, my God, we are goldfish over here you know <laughs> yeah but you guys are doing it dude you guys, that's why i said like where you guys are gonna go in the next five years your trajectory you don't even understand where it'll be like it's gonna be insane to watch you guys succeed 
if you do some of the things that we talked about. Well, again, one of those things sticking together, and all, you guys will be f- head and shoulders ahead of us. Well, man, we appreciate that's, that. Uh, that's uh, that's an honor to hear. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think. Yeah, it's an honor yeah, to yeah. sit down and talk to you. You have so much wisdom. You might actually be like have the most wisdom out of anyone I've ever <laughs> talked to. Yeah. And and great advice. And it's all like it's all sound like it all makes complete sense. Mm-hmm. So uh, thank you very much yeah, for your time you and just coming here and doing this. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. You want to plug anything? Uh, yeah. The only thing that I really focus on, I, I own uh, four or five companies now, but the one thing I'm doing the very, very most of is mentoring both in groups and in individuals. I have a, a, a group called Limitless Society. You guys have seen that. Yep. And it's, it's literally this. This is what I do. I sit and I get to teach people and I, it's simple. It's discipline, mindset, and habits to make you become the greatest version of you, which is to accomplish everything you've ever want to accomplish. And so Again, for your listeners, if you guys like liked the shit that I was talking about, like join, come to Limitless Society. And every week, this is what we talk about. I have a whole call like this, and it's in front of hundreds of people that I teach this shit because if you learn it, you can do it, and then you become successful as shit. And you're like, why didn't I do that earlier? With all the companies and all the shit I'm doing, all I want to do now is I want to help people become the greatest version of them and then accomplish the shit that you guys are accomplishing, which is everything you were meant to do. Well, there we go, guys. Yeah, if you guys are interested, go and check it out. And uh, we appreciate you so much for Absolutely, coming on man. the podcast. Yeah. And uh, subscribe if you haven't. We'll see you guys in the next one. I literally feel like I should pay for that. <laughs> yeah, I <do. laughs> like I do.